Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This is S4A live stream number 33 being recorded on August 17, 2022. We just had uh, two streams last week. So this stream is just some chat. We have, in fact, been chatting in the Twitch chat for uh, 45 minutes or so. And um, this is one of our booster streams, really just chatting. I don't have any articles prepared. Uh, we've already been going through our sort of usual COVID stuff and having that discussion. And uh, honestly, we just did a stream on Saturday. So it's only been about four days. There's not a whole lot of news to report in the COVID monkeypox area. Uh, so we can skip that for today and just continue on with the chat. Again, this is a pretty light and leisurely uh, live stream today um, for a number of reasons. But uh, as far as what's new on the channel, there will be a number of uh, audiobooks up this week. So keep your eyes open for that. I do have another um, COVID update, dedicated video or two coming soon, but that may not be until next week. I do want to get uh, some audiobooks finished first. All right. So for people who are in the chat, I'm going to resume that now. So first comment, hey, as Marxists, we don't buy bourgeois electoralism and bourgeois democracy in general, but... What do you say to the argument that if our vote didn't matter, they wouldn't do so much voter suppression? Yeah, I mean, um, one thing that they have been able to pretty much prevent entirely in the U.S. is the real emergence of any kind of a left party. Um, you know, I've looked at this fairly extensively. <laughs> like, uh, you look through, you know, the last 150 years or so, uh, particularly like the last 100, 120 years in particular, and, um, you know, you'll see various left parties struggling to get off the ground, and none really do. And uh, so I think that they have been able to, via various means, and we were talking about this earlier with, um, you know, the, the Democrats running like John Kerry in 2004, supremely uncharismatic person, against George W. Bush, who Bush and Cheney there was a lot of clamor, I would say much of it justified, about how alarming the far-right, you know, divergence uh, they were pushing at the time was. And, you know, the Democrats were there with all the anti-Bush stuff. And then they go ahead and run John fucking Kerry against him. And it's so close that, um, you know, it, it's there is evidence from journalist Greg Palast or Palast, P-A-L-A-S-T, that Ohio was thrown in 2004, just like Florida was uh, fudged in 2000. So, but the fact that it was even that close is kind of the problem. Um, so what do I say to the argument that if our vote didn't matter, they wouldn't do so much voter suppression? They've been able to like suppress it to the point where there are two parties and that is it. And seemingly uh, there always will be only two parties. So, I mean, it's enabled them enormous control over political discussion and political thought generally. Um, I wouldn't say that our vote doesn't matter. The problem is, like, even when you... Um, so, in other words, the problem with sort of voting socialism in is that it's not that simple. It's not that there's a problem with electing socialist politicians. The problem is that... Um, the real push to abolish capitalism can't just be done from the seat of the capitalist government. So you look, for example, at Salvador Allende. So we have some audiobooks um, from him on the channel, and there's kind of like one from each year. There is a speech from um, before, you know, while he was running for president, and then one from when he got elected, and then one from one year in, and then the fourth is him being overthrown in a coup, um, desperately, you know, broadcasting his last words over radio transmission. So the problem is um, it doesn't really follow the Marxist-Leninist process of building up a revolutionary mass movement. It relies too much on the brain and too little on the body, so to speak. And um, so I'd say that the, the problem with voting is not, it's not like, it's a bad thing to elect socialist politicians. The problem is it's they're very limited in terms of what they can do on their own. So, no, I mean, there's there, the voter suppression matters and the electoral fraud matters. 
Um, and, you know, it's so ironic now that MAGA is saying that it was just like so transparently um, like absurd, you know, Trump saying like, you know, we need 12,000 votes, just find them anywhere. He's on fucking tape saying that, or like digital, whatever. There's still not a good, we, we still say tape because it's just, that's, that's the word. You, you're on tape. Well, there's no longer any tape involved. What do you say? You're on, you're on a digital file. You're on a wave file saying, like, it just does not have the same ring. Anyway, like, you have Trump recorded. The audio is there saying, like, come up with the votes. I don't care. And, yeah, that's a bad Trump impression. Um, and yet people are still like, oh, they rigged the election. When literally Republicans have been trying to rig elections for Republicans for, like, 20-some years. So um, it's just insane, and there's no depth, you know, there, there's no limit to the hypocrisy. Um, you know, some of this is what differences there are between the Democrats and the Republicans. The people who support the Republicans uh, are willing to go to sort of any length to, um, you know, fight for those in the electoral system. So anyway, those are a few of my thoughts. I'm happy to continue that if there's another comment. So anyway, um, next comment. Hello, S4A. Hello. I remember seeing someone comment that, quote, I love America. I know I've said it so many times before. The more I learn of her history, the more amazing she becomes. Okay. Um, who was this person? <laughs> uh, originating from the settler colonial state of Canada, the more I learn about Canadian history, the more I despise it, and the more radical I become. With the genocide of indigenous people being a Jun uh, with the genocide of indigenous people being a junior partner in imperialism and exploitation of third world countries, how can we deal with these social patriots? Thanks. Well, um, yeah, I mean, I agree. That is more the correct response is to be alarmed at, um, you know, settler colonial genocidal history being a junior partner in, in imperialism and exploitation of third world countries that would be the junior partner in imperialism um yeah those are connecting concepts uh, how can we deal with them well there's been an ongoing struggle against the hat socks or patriotic socialists um these are right i mean a lot of times they're just outright fascists who are trying to co-opt the name of socialism or marxism or communism or marxism leninism like they all use different monikers but um you know how do we deal with them just keep calling them out. It's It's been going on for like a year now. Uh, I'd say for the first major conflict was over the land back thing. That was like last fall, last uh, October, November. And there have been multiple questions since then. And it's sort of separated out into like the Infracell, Peter Coffin, Caleb Maupin, Jackson Hinkle, those people, and then kind of everybody else. I think that the lines are getting drawn on that, and I think the Pat Sox have really nowhere to go. I think that it's been burning out for some time. So, I mean, just keep up with it. Um, you know, another book, if anybody's looking for kind of some basics, I haven't done it as an audiobook because it is kind of a long book, and it would take me like a month probably to record the whole thing, though I may do it at some point, is um, Howard Zinn's People's History of the United States. Now, it's not specific to Canada, but... Um, you know, read something like that. And the point in, you know, we've done a lot of texts on war and nationalism from Lenin. I'm continuing that. Those are going to be some more of the audiobooks that are going up on the channel this week. Hold on, I just got to take a sip of something. <clears throat> My voice is a bit scratchy today. Okay. So what Lenin said is like, obviously, point one is internationalism. Internationalism first. Last and always, internationalism is key. Socialism is nothing if it's not internationalist. So that's the first thing. And Stalin reinforces this in um, Marxism and the National Question and talking about how even within the framework of capitalism, like even without a socialist revolution having taken place, uh, Marxists should always be pushing to minimize and make impossible in every way that that we can national strife because um it always takes away 
from the proletariat. The proletariat has our own solution. It's proletarian internationalism. Once in a while, um, the proletariat may, if there is particularly bad national oppression and particularly at an earlier stage of capitalism trying to assert itself, the proletariat may at times um, join in the national struggle, which is fundamentally bourgeois. But um, this is this is a pretty limited where those circumstances make sense. Stalin concludes that, you know, the proletariat cannot rally under the bourgeois flag. Not really, not not for any length of time. So uh, it's a fundamental error for all these like Pat Sox to be using the bourgeois Russian flag or the bourgeois U.S. flag. That's not remotely accurate. You're talking about highly advanced capitalist imperialist powers. Russia may be a new kid on the block for imperialism, really has only had its shit together for about 20 years, but nonetheless, it is at the most advanced stage of capitalism, aka imperialism. Just like, it's not about the intention of the country. If we were to make it about the intention of the country or its leadership, that would make us idealist. I want to do that. So it's the material needs of highly advanced capitalism is conquest of more territory, etc. Exporting capital because they've already completely conquered the home market and they need to keep expanding. So it's just what happens. It doesn't really matter whether, you know, uh, Putin's a nice guy or not. This is just what highly advanced capitalism needs and will keep doing until it is abolished by socialists. So just accepting that as material fact, um, yeah, the sort of Patsock errors um and you know how do we combat it the only time as i was saying where it makes any kind of sense to have like a national pride it's not even really a national pride what lenin was advocating for we covered this in some of the audiobooks that went up recently basically lenin is advocating for like um having some pride in the fact that russian workers were able to contribute something to world history other than just new advancements in feudalist and capitalist torture and exploitation, like that there were rebellions at different times. Like that's what Lenin was calling for celebrating. And, you know, okay, it happened within Russia. So like we as other class conscious Russian proletarians can say, hey, yes, our people are not exclusively just victims or perpetrators, but actually we have contributed something to the history of uh, liberation. That has really nothing to do with the national struggle and is more in line with internationalist solidarity than with nationalist patriotism. Again, remember the national project is fundamentally a bourgeois project. So, um, you know, know your history. That was the point of recommending the Howard Zinn thing is like, well, I don't know if there's a Canadian equivalent, by the way, of that, but the, the Zinn thing, probably some of it is gonna to extend to Canada as well. Um, particularly in the early half, the sort of conquest of the continent. <clears throat> Probably a lot of that will be similar. Um, you know, up through like the War of Independence, because, you know, there's a lot of mention of the British. And obviously, like, all this was just British territory. There was some French territory and Spanish. But like, as far as what was British territory, that extends into Canada, or what is, you know, now known as Canada and what is now known as the United States as well. So I'm sure that there will be applicable overlap you know point those things out and just say that this is not something that anybody should be proud of um unless you're an imperialist also so and the only times where there's any sort of you know pride to be had it's really more of a class-based pride than a national pride so it's really i think the one of the errors being made there that people could conceivably fall for is um you know, calling what should more properly be called solidarity patriotism. Um, okay, somebody comments that they have an irrational hatred for Tom Hanks. And that's fine. I hope you get through that someday. And I think you probably can and go on to lead a healthy and happy life. You know, if you want to talk about that more, I, I guess I guess we could do that. I'm really not sure where that came from, but but I wish you all the best. Um, I tell Democrats that their leaders fund right-wing Republicans' campaigns, and most don't know that. 
Yeah, so there was uh, there were news stories about this recently, and then Second Thought did a whole video about it. And my thoughts on the Second Thought video are, um, I thought that the first two thirds of that video were excellent. I was really getting ready to like share it in the community tab because I thought it was so good. I thought it had some kind of significant flaws in the last third of it because it sounded like, um, from the way he was presenting it, that it was like these Democrats were like the sole reason that the far right existed. That was at least how it was like coming off to me. I'm sure he doesn't believe that, but um, that was like how it was coming off to me from the video. I thought that that could have been done better. Um, and uh, I have in fact shared that uh, feedback. So this isn't just like, you know, I'm just like talking behind his back or whatever. Uh, that's not the point. I generally think Second Thought is a, is a very good channel reaching a lot of people. Um, but in fact, I suggested that, you know, maybe um, I think that the video could come up, come off as downplaying if unintentionally downplaying all of the far right organizing that is going on and is in fact vital um, for the right wing to be doing its thing right now. There's an enormous amount of grassroots um, right wing organizing has been since the 70s, 80s, 90s. They used to have fax networks like before the internet and stuff. They would use bulletin board systems online before there were websites. Um, you know, they, they were, they were pretty organized, the like, you know, patriotic right-wing populists. Um, so I think that, you know, and, and that's what we eventually saw in the emergence of the Tea Party, which yes, it was astroturfed, but the people showing up to those Tea Party rallies did not come out of nowhere. They came out of the woodwork of all these grassroots, um, far right networks. And I think that the video, if in, if inadvertently, um, wound up downplaying that. And so I suggested maybe a future video on all of the right wing organizing that goes on. Like even something, this isn't even really grassroots, but something like ALEC, A-L-E-C. Um, this is a conservative think tank that just makes conservative legislation and uh, hands it to... Republican senators, or not just senators, but Congress people also, um, to just like adapt it to their state. Just basically like there's a number of blanks where they just have to like fill in their state's name, and that's how they're getting a lot of this. While well, we were just talking about the uh, the educational gag orders, that's one of the ways that they do it. Um, so I think it's it's a mistake to um, just downplay that. I think it's also a mistake to focus exclusively on the far like the quote far right Republicans. Yes, MAGA is a real problem because, you know, in the Bush and Cheney days, for example, in the 2000s, they didn't really have like a um, popular grassroots movement in the same way that they do now. That's where you start really getting into more fascism is when you get the grassroots like mass mobilization. Uh, because, you know, again, fascism is essentially pseudo-socialism. It's um, revolutionary aesthetics, counter-revolutionary content propped up in times of severe crisis for capitalism to, um, you know, for workers who aren't particularly class conscious, who are more easily duped to um, get sucked into that instead of into actual socialism. You know, it sort of looks like socialism. It sounds angry. It tries to co-opt radical and revolutionary rhetoric in service of something that looks and sounds like a revolution, but actually just furthers the status quo. So um, we're definitely into that phase now, and that is a problem. But really, like the Republican Party as a whole is not that different <laughs> in like substance. Um, it's I, I would say uh, a lot of it is a stylistic rather than a substantial difference. So, but yeah, I mean, this is it's even if the Democrats weren't actively funding ad campaigns, which I do think is bizarre, and I've seen it in my area as well, like signs for Republican candidates, like paid for by the fucking Democratic Party, or they run ads or like all that stuff, you know, any kind of political advertising. Democrats are literally um, taking out ads and other forms of support for the far right candidate. So how did this work for Hillary Clinton? They called it the Pied Piper strategy. Well, she fucking lost to the guy. His name was Donald Trump. So it's not a good strategy. It doesn't really work even along its own terms. I guess it works sometimes, but it also has some pretty catastrophic failures. Um, not a good strategy. They keep doing it anyway. But the point is, even if they didn't do this, 
Um, the Democrats perpetuate the existence of the Republicans implicitly by not fighting them. You know, if um, we've had this conversation before, but I'd say it again. The Democrats could at any time ally with the left. If they were serious about being an anti-fascist party, please, please hold your laughter, hold your laughter. But if the Democrats were serious about being an anti-fascist party rather than a fascist collaborating party, which is exactly what they are, they would ally with the left and enact a broad slate of popular reforms, which would significantly improve the lives of working people um, and be hugely popular. And it would put the Republican Party out of business. It would, because uh, you know that the Republicans would not, you know, follow. Of course, the Democrats aren't doing either. But the point is, um, if the Democrats were for real, the, the distinction here being the Republicans don't even really pay lip service to this stuff. The Democrats do. You know, all the different Democrats in the primary, the presidential primary, they're all talking about, you know, how they were for Medicare for all or a public option or whatever. Then they get into office and obviously nothing of the kind ever fucking comes close to happening. But the Republicans, they don't, they're like, you know, uh, using medicine as socialist, whatever, like having a school as socialist. I'm going to obliterate not only the current government, but any future government. I will invent a quantum device that will allow me to travel to all parallel universes and obliterate any form of education or medicine, you know, et cetera. Like that's the Republican rhetoric. So obviously they're not going to do this stuff. Uh, but the Democrats, if they were for real about oh, the threat of the Republican Party and the boogeyman and, like, don't get me wrong, Republicans suck, and yes, it's alarming what they're doing. But when the Democrats say this, it's merely to raise money. It's merely to just try to get your vote. At the end of the day, they keep that boogeyman around. They don't, like, really do anything to drive the Republicans out of existence. Again, if they were serious about that, they would ally with the left, enact a broad slate of popular reforms, think Bernie Sanders. They would throw all their weight behind that, um, which is kind of what happened in the New Deal. And then the Republicans wouldn't take Congress again, but maybe twice for a century, which is, again, what happened, uh, you know, for like 50 years um, in in the United States in the mid 20th century. Republicans were just like they, they never had a majority. So, um, you know, the Republican Party at this point could be it's so reactionary. It's so far to the right, so far behind anything and they're so aggressive about just attacking any notion of a decent life for most people um actively promoting racism actively trying to um extinguish even the possibility of discussing racism like in a classroom that's what we were talking about before um and so the democrats stand there and you know are they serious about opposing it no. Again, they could do that just by winning people over, ally with the left, and enact a slate of broad popular reforms. Um, this would convert the Republicans in one or two election cycles into a regional party with little to no sway in national politics. But what's the problem? Well, the same people own and control the Democrats and the Republicans, roughly speaking, certainly the same class, and in many cases, the exact same entities are funding both parties. What they want is they want U.S. politics and the political discussion and all of the consciousness around that in the public. They want it to stay anchored firmly between the Democrats and Republicans. If the Republicans were to be pushed off the edge of the map, you know, shattered and swept up in the dustbin of history, that would put the, you know, the, the fulcrum uh, of politics between the Democrats and the left. And then the left isn't owned by those people, and that would actually put their class rule into real jeopardy. So where it is now between the Democrats and Republicans, their class rule is not in any jeopardy, and uh, they want to keep it that way. So even without funding the, quote, far right, which, yeah, I mean, there are more extreme Republicans than ones who sound less extreme. Um, you know, yeah, they, they fund these kind of crazy candidates who they think can't win or who it would be easier to run against and who also would make a better boogeyman because, you know, they've been pulling this like anybody but Trump, anybody but Bush. They've been pulling that thing for a long time. And it's hugely unpopular. People hate them for it, but they do it anyway. Democrats do. Um, you know, that's their strategy. But yeah, like I said, even if they weren't funding them, 
they're keeping them alive. Absolutely. But it's not because the Democrats are some independent political force. You know, it's not their own wishes to do that. It's on behalf of the people who own them, who happen to be mostly the same people who own the Republicans. It's about keeping the discussion away from me and you. You know, it's about keeping it out of our hands and just in the hands of corporate pools. So. China is the example, basically, for COVID. I mean, there are other countries that have had good responses. Many of them are islands, such as New Zealand or like Thailand, um, have, you know, had pretty good responses as far as overall cases. Uh, Vietnam also, uh, you know, good example. But I mean, China is, I think, the largest country. It's also not an island. The fact that they've been able to do what they have done is amazing. Um, and I think I put up videos early on in the channel where... Um, you know, China would build a hospital in like 10 days that could house like you know, a thousand people or something. Um, they, they, they took it really seriously and they just did the thing that needed to be done. So you'll never see that in the United States. Never. Not under capitalism. All right. Next comment. Most people I talk to are not happy with Democrats, but when I bring up another option outside of them, such as a, another party, um, they just can't get over the whole but the elections thing and they're still on Team Democrat because they don't want to work for something better. Yeah, that a lot of people just, they would like something better to be handed to them, but they're not willing to help build it. That's a fact. And it is hard to convince them if you don't have a long period of time to work with them. Yeah, um, you know, this is something I say often to people and the answer is always no when they start saying, you know, Oh, when are the Greens going to get their act together? Or, you know, when is there going to be a third party? I'll say, um, have you been active in building that party? The answer is always no. I'll say, well, why are you waiting around? Why aren't you helping? And there's never a good reason. There's never a good reason. So I think that the most charitable thing you can say in a case like that is people are literally not used to, and in some cases have not processed the concept of uh, a participatory body you know like a party you could actually get involved with where your voice actually matters um but uh you know at some point you have to realize like yes it is on us to build up workers parties it, it is on us to do that like no one is gonna just develop one and hand it to you um this is something we actually have to do and you know the sooner that people get that through their heads the better this is not going to, like, get dropped down from on high. So that's one thing I often point out to people. It's like, well, have you done anything to help build one of these parties? And if not, like, shut up. And uh, like I said, the answer, I, I can think of one case where the answer was not no. And, and that's out of many. Someone please stop Elon Musk before he starts buying up football clubs. He, quote, joked about buying Manchester United. Well, if it's anything like his joke of buying Twitter, uh, he will not do it, and it will cost him a billion dollars. So, say, I will say I saw an article recently about how like Musk never had any plans to build the Hyperloop. Uh, he really just um, put the whole thing out there. Excuse me, put the whole thing up out there to tie up um, governments, just because he hates public transit. Like, but it was like more than a theory. They actually had like some quotes and evidence to back this up. Um, people stop listening to Elon Musk challenge. Just what a fucking charlatan. Um, you've organized for a long time, S4A. Have you ever met anyone and were sure they were a Fed? Like in your time with anti-war Occupy, was there ever an obvious FBI agent or anything? Uh, I would say yes. Um... And I'm sure that there were many others who weren't less obvious. But yeah, was there anyone who was obvious? Yes. Um, they had a long history of being in law enforcement and were stupid enough to tell me that. So, um, yeah. <laughs> um, particularly with this person's history, it was like, okay, but I should believe you're not a cop now and that your entire life, they were, they were retired your entire, like, retired life doesn't revolve around, like, ex-law enforcement things. So it was just, um, 
Yeah. Uh, there have been other people, too, that, yes, I felt fairly sure. But, um, you know, I think it comes down to, in the end, uh, unless somebody is, like, truly, truly um, proven to be in some way, uh, you have to go on, you know, just basic trust and evaluating them on their positions. But also there are sort of things that people need to do to keep themselves safe. Um, because, okay, so this is the thing. I keep saying, keep seeing Asatar Bayer or Bear. I don't know how he pronounces his name. Um, I'm surprised that that guy's name is still so prominent in the sort of left socialist world. I saw him interviewed on some channels recently. He had a thing on Twitter uh, last year, I believe it was 2021, where um, he was actively soliciting um, sexual content from female followers of his on his like political account. Uh, we do know that uh, cops will often use the tag. I'm not saying that he's a cop, but what I'm saying is behavior you do not want to engage in if you don't want to be mistaken for a cop is any kind of um, like relationship involvement or things like that, or people soliciting relationships is usually men soliciting women, um, perhaps not exclusively, but oftentimes. Um, there... There's an article we covered about this, I believe, in the past. I keep meaning to sort of bring it up again. But um, there have been cases where I think it was a UK environmental activist who was like kind of a star activist. Um, she married another, quote, environmental activist who she, like had the guy's baby and everything. Turned out he was a cop assigned to like control her, basically. So you got to be careful with personal relationships. And if people are out for some kind of personal or sexual relationship in the activist world, that should just be shut down immediately, I think. Um, it is a tactic that, that cops often use. That's not to say everybody doing it is a cop necessarily. It just could be that they have really bad judgment. But um, that should, you know, be one sign. Um, there are kind of other sketchy behaviors that you can look out for. I know I have like a bunch on this. I was going to do a video on it um, in the past. Maybe I'll let me make a note of bringing that back up again. Um, but yeah, people who have, you know, more of the bigoted or discriminatory views and try to bring that into the movement, like this entire Pat Sock thing, that's also a pretty good indicator. Doesn't mean that every last person who does that is a cop. That's not what it means. Um, it means that that is something that cops do, and the more of that that they can get going, the happier they are. Because these are bigoted, not chauvinistic, non-internationalist things that do not promote solid proletarian unity. You know, so there, there's an example. Um, but I mean, you know, whether I have personally or not, I mean, the answer is yes. But um, I think anybody who's been involved, um, you know, for any any real world activities for a substantial period of time. Assume you have you have met at least one, even if you haven't recognized it. Now, it's also not great to get real paranoid about that. That's not going to help you either. And also calling everybody fed, what is known as fed jacketing or snitch jacketing. That's not good either because that is just going to sow paranoia. Um, but if there is a really particular uh, person that you think is really concerning, um, you know, it can be time to have a discussion with people you actually trust, like, for example, people you knew before getting into the movement. There's a lot more that can be said about this. I really don't want that to be the last word on this subject. So let me just be really clear about that. Um, I'll try to follow up with some articles because a lot has been written about this topic. Um, yes, it's something to be concerned about, especially in the United States, which really is a police state. Um but, uh, you know, this is, you know, if you go into an org with some friends and, uh, you know, then you have a basis for knowing these people outside the org. And then, you know, you all can check with each other on your vibes about a particular person. If one of you feels that they're sketchy or something like that. Um, yeah. But like I said, this is the beginning of that conversation, um, not not the end of it. So I just want to be clear about that. 
Uh, Bernie supports Israel in the bombing of Yugoslavia. Yes, he does. Sure, sure. Well, I mean, he did support the bombing of Yugoslavia. That, that was a while ago, but yes, he did. Yeah, the task forces were a sham. We were talking about the, uh, the Bernie Biden task forces um, <laughs> that, uh, you know, if implemented, would make uh, Joe Biden the most progressive president since FDR. Yeah, that didn't happen. And Bernie's whole 100-day plan for accountability was just uh, complete, complete. I mean, it came to nothing. It came to nothing. Don't know what he's waiting for. But you, you know it was all just a sham. Go back. You really want a, an instructive and educational experience. Go back to October 2020, a month before the election, and listen to the fucking bullshit the Democrats were putting out about all the things they were going to do. Holy shit. You will not believe it. And yes, Yugoslavia was the breaking point between Bernie and Michael Parenti. So yeah, uh, there's an interview with Michael Parenti where he says that that he used to be friends with Bernie Sanders, I believe they're in the same party at one point. And, um, you know, he started, saw Bernie drift right. And um, that was the point where Parenti was just like, okay, I think we have substantial differences. I'm not sure what this comment is. I'm just going to read this out. Maybe it'll be clear. And they literally said, if we want to possibly bring up something, I'm really trying to find the, this starts with an end, but I'm missing the, I'm not seeing the beginning of this comment anywhere. And they literally said, I don't know who they are. If we wanted to possibly bring up something that we have to run for a position and then possibly bring it up. And we can't ask for alternative teaching conditions because we are quote back to normal. Oh, is this on your job where the COVID thing was like? Getting really out of hand. And students are only asked to wear a mask if they know they have COVID. Holy shit. Well, you know, if somebody knows that they have COVID, they should not be in school. This is going to be, I mean, the biggest fucking absolute disaster. I don't even, I don't know what's going to happen. Like, school is going back into session. And it is going to be such a gigantic dumpster fire isn't even going to cover it. I mean, I don't know. It's it's horrifying to think about. Uh, we are not back to normal. The virus isn't. And that's exactly what, you know, if the virus had a brain, that's exactly what it would want you to think. <laughs> is that, like, oh, everything's good. Um, it is only going to spread COVID. It will only help COVID keep mutating to be more immune evasive. And so that our bodies are have a harder time of fighting it off until all the booster shots in the world aren't going to do a fucking thing and this is the thing you know the vaccines were great for buying ourselves some breathing room in the symptoms if as a you know last resort like you tried to do all of the um you know like we did the shutdowns we did the mask mandates we really did significant transmission controls but you know people people would still even with all that sometimes get infected anyway that's what the vaccine is for. It's to give yourself some breathing room with the symptoms when those unfortunate cases accidentally do happen despite best efforts. But they're not just meant to be a replacement for the best efforts. And so what we're doing collectively is burning through all of the protection that the vaccines can provide um, until basically the virus is going to completely mutate around the vaccines. And... Um, you know, like I said, the hot, the uh, efficacy against hospitalizations was basically cut in half between Delta and Omicron. If we get another significant mutation where it gets cut down to half again, you're going to be down to 20% efficacy. And of course, that's different in different um, demographics, but it, that's that's the overall efficacy. That, you know, it's just um, pissing away what otherwise could have been a very significant barrier for protecting people from this disease. So I'm right there with you. So I'm way behind the chat. I'm <laughs> realizing there's stuff here that uh, we were talking about quite a while ago. Uh, we were talking about Bernie and the squad. And um, how about the committee spot that AOC couldn't do force to vote over? Well, she could. She wouldn't. Uh, you yeah, know, that was about the last thing I agreed with Jimmy Dore on a year and a half ago was uh, force to vote. That was actually a decent idea. And, you know, they're like, oh, no, no, we're going to do it when the time is right. 
Well, it's been a year and a half. Um, is there ever going to be a right time? Of course there isn't. Of course there isn't. So, uh, you know, like I said, credit where due. Um, unfortunately, like, the you know, like two weeks after that, Jimmy Dore had on that Boogaloo Boy that he, like, did a virtually non-critical infomercial for. And um, we covered the hell out of that. Uh, that was that was where I was just like, all right, Dore's been courting the right wing and libertarians for a while now. He's become a very different person, uh, you know, than 2016 Jimmy Dore, like pro Bernie, anti Trump Jimmy Dore. Uh, he's become a very different person since cultivating that, you know, right wing audience, that whole grift. Uh, but the, that was the last thing I agreed with him on was like, yeah, AOC did say that she was going to bring the ruckus. And look at where we're at. We're not even talking about a public option. Like, let alone Medicare for all, and we're in a fucking pandemic. So, yeah, that would have been, um, that that was actually a strategy that made sense. Uh, I don't think uh, Jimmy Dore is a brilliant person, far from it, but he happened to come up with a decent idea that time, or, you know, at least uh, voiced it. So, yeah. Unfortunately, the grift has completely consumed him, whether it's the Tucker Carlson appearances or whatever, uh, he's completely... Uh, Completely gone off the deep end. And as I've said before, there's a comment on my uh, audiobook of Lenin's What is to be Done right at the end um, that uh, I referenced, uh, in fact, Jimmy Dore <laughs> in the audiobook. This was like right before the Boogaloo Boy thing. And, uh, you know, like sort of the last few minutes of Jimmy Dore being palatable. And I had to put like a disclaimer like, sorry, folks, I mentioned Jimmy Dore in this fucking audiobook. Uh, in the comments on it, because to be fair, there was a section that did absolutely remind me of it. It was like this whole, you know, how dare you uh, socialists have independent opinions kind of thing. Um, it sounded very much like the force to vote thing, to be honest. So um, appropriate. Unfortunately, he then became completely opportunist, uh, you know, from then, then on. Hang on one sec. All right. Yeah, that's um, I feel like that, that audiobook got marred by that. But yeah, um, yeah, forced to vote made sense. Because again, you know, 70% of the country supports Medicare for all. I think only 8% of Democrats, specifically, only 8% of Democrats do not support Medicare for all. So like 92% of the party is at least like neutral or positive on it. And um, the majority of those are positive on it, like not neutral. Yet the Democrats, like, yet do you hear 92% of Democratic politicians like advocating for Medicare for all? Obviously you don't. Some talk of uh, Bernie and Parenti, like, why were they friends, whatever. <clears throat> they started out in the same party, is my understanding. And that was, like, in the 70s. Yeah, so discussion of uh, Bernie just gushes over the imperialist Sokdem Nordic countries. Uh, I want to be clear, I 100% do not think he's a socialist. Yeah. Um, and another comment, yes, and the Nordics won't even be Sokdem for long. It's already slipping away. In Sweden, the youth is right-wing and anti them. That's what I heard. Well, Sweden also had that huge anti-immigrant uh, thing going on. And, um, you know, that, that's been kind of a running problem there, like the rise of the far right. This is kind of a common um, thing around the, quote, right populists. You know, we did the video on Maupin and Dugan recently. One of the common threads of all the parties that Dugan lists as examples is anti-immigrant sentiment. So that's that's a big way that, you know, a lot of these like populists within Fortress Europe, Fortress America are gaining ground is, is anti-immigrant sentiment. So it's completely uh, on Marxists to oppose all of that. We have to be, um, you know, you, you can't give that an inch. Um, yeah, but as far as it's slipping away, this is also because um, the capitalists after 2008, pretty much uniformly, and it was already going in the 90s too, after the um, destruction of the USSR, 
uh, they were already like pulling back all the concessions that they could get away with. And then after 2008, with the, you know, chorus of austerity and shared sacrifice, they started pulling back more and more of the concessions, you know, for more of this like austerity um, type of rule. This is late stage capitalism, shrinking profits. There is no longer anything um, for the capitalists to give away and still maintain their you know, standard of being masters of the universe. So um, austerity is the thing. Plus, politically, again, is point two. Uh, they only made the, the social democratic concessions for as long as it was you know, necessary to sort of buy people off. Now people are so unorganized and so not class conscious that they're like, what are we paying these people not to revolt for? So, so and it's, you know, so it gets reeled back in, in other words, uh, all these concessions get abandoned. Huh. So Simon, what are you talking about? Um, I'm not uh, questioning, I just am curious where, or I'm not questioning the basic veracity of what you're saying i'm just curious for details you say only in europe can you get quote progressive liberals calling communism the greatest danger today sometimes they even call conservative right-wingers communists so extreme confusion about what um communism is obviously it's part of the reason we do this channel uh, but uh but um what specifically are you talking about there i mean i know in the united states we have um boomers who like say like comrade trump because you know they think like he and putin are a team and that putin is like still communist or something but that's i think that's different uh did i see that in ages 18 to 49 there's been a 40 percent increase in all-cause mort mortality no i have not seen that um can you give me a link on that so um yeah you know, mage mantis i think you need a uh a timeout unfortunately because we don't do the covid denial and minimization thing here so uh yes uh but i would love to see a link on that all causes mortality i mean covid is one of the leading causes of death <clears throat> and it's also been shown in several population studies that you know out of like groups of 80,000 people, for example, like really large amounts of uh, um, you know, large sample size, uh, there is a uh, decreased lifespan, like much more likely to die in the next 12 months after getting COVID. Really bad. Um, White House today says that there is a new vaccine coming in a few weeks that targets newer variants. They've been saying this for a long time. So I'll believe it when I see it. um you know to be honest it would be great if uh they would stop doing the mrna vaccines not that there's anything wrong with the M mrna vaccines per se but the amount of people who have used that as an excuse not to get vaccinated it's kind of ridiculous um you know it would be good if there was some alternative where people couldn't hide behind that and i'll bet this is going to be another mrna vaccine you know Again, not that there's anything wrong with that, but, you know, it, do, it does give more people something to hide behind. Yeah, um, well, so, okay, interesting. Um, in the U.S., your local vote matters more than your vote for president. That said, I think there is something to be said about getting Greens to 5% to participate in the debate, at least. Howie Hawkins would make Biden and Trump look like demented corpses. Uh, that's probably true. However, I think the threshold is now 15% for the private corporation that holds the presidential debates. Um, somebody could maybe correct on that. The 5% is to get federal funding last i checked like if you get five percent in the um in the election then you qualify for uh federal funding for the party but i think they've they've actually upped the um you have to pull 15 percent in order to get into the debates 
I think that was specifically set there after Ross Perot, because Perot was polling at like 20% or something. Back in the 90s. I've heard the argument that local elections matter more. I would say that they do, especially if your state does, um, you know, any kind of like direct voting, like referendums. So I definitely encourage that uh like do whatever you can as far as those campaigns um you know like in different states they'll put like minimum wage or sometimes like other issues on the ballot uh that's worth it if you're in one of those states and uh but anyway uh yeah and as far as like the rest of the local government i don't know most of them are still pretty much dems and republicans Sometimes in some of the states, it can be easier or harder to get people in the state legislature or something like that. I mean, I think, honestly, any any socialist that you can get into a position like that, it's not going to hurt. I think it's going to be helpful. But, um, yeah, I mean, I guess it, there may be some specifics that it depends on. But I think the problem is not like, oh, we've been electing tons of socialists into these things and and they're doing bad things. I think that... That hasn't been happening at all. <laughs> so anyway, but continuing the comment, um, all I see is a wave of the squad copycats still feeding into establishment politics as usual. I volunteered for my alderman, but he failed to take any political action on important community issues since being elected. So that's the thing about the squad. We were talking about this uh, more earlier. Like Bernie at least was outside the Democratic Party for 30 years. I mean, technically still is, but... You know, he at least had that track record of being somewhat independent. And there was talk that um, he maybe had a, I think there's a counterpunch article on this. Um, he maybe had a secret agreement with the Democratic Party that if he didn't organize a party, then they wouldn't run any serious opposition against him. I'm not sure if that's true or not. But um, anyway, he was, I think, like several steps up from the squad who are like Democrats from the jump. I mean, Ilhan Omar, we, there's a video of her I did on the channel where she was asked who her favorite politician was, and she said Margaret Thatcher, because, you know, when she was a girl, she, she like, looked up to her being a female politician. And you never fucking updated that after realizing that she was, like, extremely reactionary? There was no con comment on that at all. So I think the squad is, like, pretty lukewarm from the beginning, and the fact that people get excited about these people at all, I mean, raise your expectations, you know? But yeah, I know I know what you're talking about, this wave of, like, the squad copycats. Like, we're going to make the, you know, Congress more progressive. No, you're not. That's really all I have to say about it. I mean, because these people are, like, they're not radical, they're not militant. Like, they're not going to go in there with any kind of a fighting attitude. They're there for the party first and foremost. That's what always happens with the Democrats. Again, fundamental task of the U.S. left is to break completely with the Democratic Party and with all capitalist parties. Yeah, there's some love in the comments for Kashama Sawant from the Trotskyist Socialist Alternative. You know, um, I've seen her, what was I looking at there? She she has done some good things. I think I saw some concern that she was a bit too, like, chummy with the Democrats via DSA. But again, you know, some of that may just be a symptom of we need to build up the non-Democratic Party affiliated left in a major way, hence again, the fundamental task of the U.S. left is to break completely with the Democratic Party and with all capitalist parties until you've really got that going, you know, the Bernie moment, but outside the Democratic Party. You know, um, when you're looking for progressive supporters, that's where a lot of them are. We need to fight those battles and draw those lines between us and the Democratic Party. And I think that a lot of people quietly took sides after Bernie, um, particularly the second time. I think a lot of people quietly took sides i think the lines need to be drawn more clearly so i don't know maybe more of a plan of attack on uh bernie lines let's say all right does anyone think COVID has affected the quality of prescription medication 
The only medication that aids my anxiety has stopped working. I'm wondering if it was a manufacturing problem. Uh, it may not be a manufacturing problem. You may be different after... What was So, did you get COVID or are you just saying now? I mean, you may just have higher anxiety because you're living through like a devastating pandemic that basically all the official bodies are severely gaslighting people about. Um, you, your anxiety may have just gotten worse. That would be... I haven't heard anything about quality of prescription medication being affected. Uh, my guess, if I had to guess, would be uh, your anxiety is probably just worse. Or, you know, it could be something else, just like totally independent of social processes. It could just be like something between your body and the thing. I would, I would talk to your, uh, talk to your provider, whoever's prescribing that for you. What do I think of the World Economic Forums talking about a great reset? It's funny you ask, because I just downloaded that book. Um, to me, it's just capitalism being capitalism and trying to scapegoat the working class away from the real problem, the system. So let me ask you, what is your understanding of the Great Reset? Because from what I have read about it, no one is talking about this correctly. I think it's so not the thing people are making it out to be. Um, we'll come back to that. Elon Musk is the personification of a gadget bomb. That's a new one on me. The Great Reset is them trying, this is from another comment, they're trying to rebrand capitalism. I don't even think it's that. They push this idea of stakeholder capitalism. And a reply, it'll only last for a year and then they'll bring back capitalism classic. Another comment, Asatara Bayer is a creep and one of the most boring socialists. He just repeats the most basic stuff, literally things like socialism is good and it gets thousands of likes. That's most of Marx's Twitter, though, sadly. Um, yeah, I don't know if this was before or after we started recording, but I was saying uh, I was uh, surprised to see Dr. Asatara Bayer or Bear um, still sort of doing so many interviews after some weird solicitation he was doing on Twitter um, that got pretty weird involving some underage stuff. Uh, if you're on Twitter, just ask, and we have the screenshots. But um, he was repeatedly told, like, stop. <laughs> and he just kept kind of going out there, like, soliciting, like, who's horny? And it, dude, do not do that. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, it got very weird, and to be honest, you don't see a ton of um, large Twitter accounts doing that. It, it really stood out. It really stood out. So somebody just got here. I was out organizing. I tried asking the lady at the local coffee shop if she wanted to unionize, and she said unions suck. So I was like, you suck, and left. That's enough organizing for now. Um... Well, you know, that, first of all, okay, <laughs> there's a few things I'd probably say about that. Um, don't, uh, as a general rule, like, approach workers at work asking about union stuff. If their manager is standing nearby, that's really bad and can get them fired. Don't do that. Uh, then, if you, for whatever reason, do... Don't say you suck and leave. Be like, well, first of all, this just isn't a good way to bring it up to anybody. <laughs> but um, because like, really, like, what are they going to say? Like, oh, do you have a union in your pocket? Are you going to hand it to me? And I just press a button and like a union magically forms. Like, what what were you going to do for this person? I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to like be an asshole, but I'm not really sure that you thought this thing through. You, know, you, you kind of put the worker in a situation there where like, what can they possibly say to you? Um, you know, and then telling them they suck, like, don't do that. Uh, if for some reason you like do have a lapse in judgment and do this, and they're like, union sucks, be like, well, I hope you reconsider someday. Have a great day. 
Because um, you probably just, if this is a true story, like solidified in their mind that, you know, unions are bad. So, yeah, don't do that. I mean, don't do that. <laughs> if there's one thing that I have tried to sell in the union organizing videos that we've done on the channel, um, it is you need like extreme caution, especially. Sorry, you need extreme caution, especially in the beginning stages. Um, if you're trying to form an organizing committee when you are a worker somewhere, you need to be very mindful of who can be listening and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, this was mm, sort of textbook, not how to approach it. So, anyway, hopefully you understand the criticism there. So I know the history of Sam Cedar. Saw a video thumbnail of Ben Empanada saying he was a neocon at some point. I used to watch Majority Report religiously, and he seemed extremely anti-Iraq war. I am not familiar with, um, with that at all. I've always considered him a very boring host. And I've never really listened to much of his show. I have pulled up the channel at times for, like, you know, Sock Dem videos in the past. <clears throat> but, um... Yeah, as another comment says, he's kind of a run-of-the-mill sock dem. I mean, even more than that, I think he's just more of a, more, like, yeah, just run-of-the-mill, like, left liberal, and I don't even know how left, to be honest. Hold on, let me, um, I'm going to type, so I'm just going to mute myself for a second and see if I can bring that up. All right, we'll see what we've got here for, like, basic info. So he's born November 28, 1966. He has been an actor, appearing in Spin City, Sex and the City, etc. Um, he was on Air America Radio, The Majority Report, alongside Janine Garofalo. So, I mean, that was, I remember Air America. It was like, you know how all the, um, like, how all the talk radio shows are, like, right-wing and, like, pretty hateful, usually? Air America was, like, an attempt to do, like, a liberal counter to it in the thick of the Bush-Cheney years. And uh, I don't think it lasted particularly long. I'm not seeing anything about him being a neocon. Yeah, I'm not seeing anything about that. Um, he has made some Yeah, I guess he was fired from MSNBC for a really horrible joke he made. And uh I'm not I'm not seeing anything specifically about like it seems like the beginning of his career was he was a comedian and then um, and then a, a liberal on Air America. So I'm not really sure where the neocon thing comes from. In fact, if anything, I mean, like the Air America thing was like anti-neocon. Yes, it was very lib, but they were very like against Bush and Cheney. So, yeah, I'm not saying that. Uh, let's see. Oh, thank you for the link. Oh, can you, can you post that link again? Um, actually, I think I got it from the headline. Never mind about the increased mortality. That should that should do. I think I was I was like trying to approve the link, and I thought I clicked allow, but it seemed to have disappeared. So anyway, all right. Um, continuing in my country, the liberal opposition compared the far right prime minister to Lenin. They also said that they're implementing communism. This was in response to some basic capitalist crisis management policies. Um, aren't you from a former socialist country? Yeah. So where did they even get this from? I mean, honestly, can you um, can you explain where in like a post-socialist situation? Um, you get something like that because don't like how does that land with anyone don't people know better 
like it's one thing like i said in the united states but um not not there so uh, it's funny but when you hear this almost every day liberals and conservatives calling each other commies it melts your brain Three weeks off of Twitter and no regrets. I think I've finally gotten to the stage of Twitter where it's fun again, but I really do have to take breaks. It gets crazy. Like, it just, it gets to where people are so hostile, like, so offensive, and um, will just, like, literally try to completely destroy your self-esteem over a slight disagreement. It is just the most hateful place on Earth. Um... There will be periods, though, where, again, I find it useful for getting news sometimes. And obviously, I go on there to plug the channel and stuff and to stay current on sort of, um, you know, things happening within the movement, stuff like news you're just literally not going to get anywhere else. Like, for example, uh, actually, let me go in and read this because this is niche content that um, no one else will care about, but the S4A audience probably will. And that's. Who's listening? So perfect. Um, if the Twitter tab will ever load. Somebody was just talking about PCUSA, uh, quote, collapsing. Although somebody in PCUSA, which is a socialist organization, um, came in to correct and say, no, it's not collapsing. There was just sort of a group of people who um, broke away from PCUSA and tried to... Um, Okay, so it's called the American Council of Bolsheviks. So the original tweet, um, this is from at Ambient Noise Machine, sorry, at Ambient Noise 666, uh, tagged me and a couple other people and said, looks like the PCUSA is collapsing. A group with about 100 members that called itself the Vanguard Party falling apart. You don't say. I'm adding a few people to get the word around so maybe people will stop recommending PCUSA. Um, for the record, I never really recommended PCUSA. Uh, I did see that their youth detachment had signed on to the uh, very good um, anti-Ukraine war statement. Uh, so that that's that's all I really saw. And I do have, you know, there's people who listen to this channel who are members of PCUSA. Like I said, I, I just have not been specifically recommending any Marxist orgs. They tend to have a lot of the same problems. Some of them have different and specific problems, but... Uh, you know, and that might be different three to five years from now, but at the current point, I'm not really recommending any. You know what they are. You want to join one and tell me how it was, let me know. There's people I do talk to regularly who are currently in PCUSA, and they're having a fine experience. There's other people I've talked to who've had very bad experience. So, you know, it is what it is, and I wouldn't say that um, it leans strongly in one direction or another, though that said, I remember back in 2020, I've seen a lot of what we would now call the Patsock kind of stuff going on. I was also um, tremendously unimpressed with how they handled the Chris Olali situation. So in, in a number of ways, not, not just directly to me, uh, because I did some videos on it, and um, but also in the way that they wound up, they literally, according to at least Danky Kang, they... Uh, deleted their entire discord server just so that people could discuss it what kind of fucking joke of a party does that apparently it's run by one guy angelo d'angelo and um i've heard many times that he just pretty much makes all the decisions and like that's that and you know a lot more centralism than um democracy anyway but uh from a defender of it there was a reply as a member of the party who spoke with the general secretary the general secretary i guess that's angelo as recently as last night no the pcusa isn't collapsing we held our own the issue arising to the split is that our illinois club got hurt as many of the traitors are from there like well who are the traitors what are you even talking about um and i said so by traitors you mean who and they said the american council of bolsheviks who sabotaged our online messaging medium, made all party emails defunct, I don't know what that means, hijacked the main party email and stole many of our party's resources, which, by the way, are still legally under our name. So I found a statement, actually, from the People's School for Marxist-Leninist Studies, PSMLS, which I guess is part of the PCUSA. And um, 
So apparently there was a declaration of the Central Executive Committee of the American Council of Bolsheviks, ACB, to the workers in the Peace USA. I'll read that in just a second. So the person who was um, denouncing them said, yup, it explains itself. Renegades from top positions in our party defected. The PSMLS account you see here is ours. Oh, but hacked by them. Okay, got it. So that's how this statement was posted. They, they hacked it. Fun fact, only 15 people defected. That's not six, 60% of our party, it's 12. So wait a minute, let's do a little math. Yeah, that is about 100 people in the party. So, um, yeah, so let's let's get the calculator. Just just to be exact, I, I don't want to mess this up. So, whoops, where'd the calculator go? Okay, so 125. Um, if they had a clear majority, they wouldn't have had to split. Fair. Um, that's fair. So, what about their argument on its merits? Um, so it says, Declaration of the ACB to the workers in the PCUSA. Let me see if I can put this up on the screen for people. The text is like really small, uh, so I'm not sure you're going to be able to read it anyway, but let me at least um, try to do that. There we go. All right. In May 2016, the Party of Communists USA held its historic first Congress in Arrow Park, New York. PCUSA's establishment was a massive step forward for the working class movement in the United States as it sought to pick up the red banner that the CPUSA had brazenly tossed into the mud. So yeah, this is my understanding as well. The basically PCUSA broke broke off of PCUSA, or sorry, blah, blah, blah. trying to speak too fast and it's a lot of the same letters. PCUSA broke away from CPUSA, that is the Communist Party of the United States, uh, because of many of the common complaints that people have about CPUSA, that it is do nothing revisionist, you know, hugs the Democratic Party constantly, just like everything goes into that direction. Um, it sought to pick up the red banner that the CPUSA had brazenly tossed into the mud, it sought to become a Bolshevik party, a party that lived up to the standards of applying dialectical materialism, and a party that would continue the legacy of the communist movement in this country. However, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, and the PCUSA has proven itself incapable of filling the historically necessary role of leading the working class to the building of socialism in this country. By the way, let me just say right now to the people in PCUSA who are upset by this, name a socialist group in the United States that has not had factions splinter off from it. This is not unique. You know, I'm sure it's shocking that it happened to you when you were originally a splinter group. But this is just the story of the left, so I would relax. Um, the PCUSA has now existed for over six years. Under the Leninist definition of party membership, PCUSA has under 100 members in a country of over 330 million people. The U.S. working class cannot wait on a party with a turnover rate of nearly 100%. That's bad. And sycophantic leadership that is actively and consistently pushing its most resolute, loyal, and energetic workers out. All of this has been done without even entertaining the possibility of utilizing the Bolshevik method of criticism and self-criticism to build a stronger and healthier party. Given this, all should be lost. Yet, let it be known that the work of comrades who dedicated years of their lives to the PCUSA is not in vain. The American Council of Bolsheviks. I gotta say, that is a kind of funny name. Um, I just think of, like, the American Council of, like, you know, like, dairy farmers or whatever. But anyway has been established as a pre-party formation exclusively by recent ex-members of the PCUSA who have over 10 combined years of dedication and loyalty to that party and currently has the support of over 60%, a device, the decisive majority, the active members of the PCUSA. So they're saying that they have the support of the majority, though the majority have not left. You know, we'll see what happens in the coming months. Uh, we urge all comrades in the PCUSA to analyze the situation of the party dialectically, to utilize the science of Marxism-Leninism in assessing the state of the party, where it has been, where it is, and where it's going. The work we're doing is a matter of life and death for billions of people across this earth. We implore you to treat the situation with the severity that it merits. The present conditions within the Bolshevik movement in this country have now come to their di dialectical conclusion. 
Okay. Dialectical analysis will lead all communists in this country, particularly those still in the peace USA. Oh God. How do people write this shit with a straight face? I'm sorry. Like whatever you think of peace USA and whatever else, just this statement, a dialectical analysis will lead all communists in this country, particularly those still in the peace USA to realize that the center of the Bolshevik movement in America now lies with the ACB and not with the now defunct peace USA. So, okay, somewhere between 15 and 50 people is the center of the Bolshevik movement in America, if you say so. Um, the current general secretary of the peace USA, Dr. Angelo D'Angelo, quite correct when he asserts that the only reason to leave a party is over ideology. Therefore, we have left peace USA. Peace USA is not a Marxist-Leninist party. It has not been for quite some time. It does not apply dialectical and historical materialism when conducting party work and mass work does not adhere to its own eight points of unity, particularly democratic centralism. Point four. Quote, History has shown us that before becoming real vanguards, the revolutionary parties usually pass through a number of stages of political and organizational development. At the outset, they are more often than not propagandist groups, and their work is mainly conducted within their own ranks. The speed with which a party passes from one stage to another depends on... We got a, like another paragraph on... Uh, Page two here. Let me get that on the screen for you all as well. Look at me go. Okay. Objective conditions as well as on the correctness of its own policies and the ability of its leadership. Unquote. The PCSA has been dying for some time and has now been put out of its misery by its most ardent workers. This alone proves our dedication. We now march onward to the building of a revolutionary vanguard party of the working class, the overthrow of capitalism the establishment of socialism we have a world to win join us to win it solidarity forever the central executive committee of the american council of bolsheviks so um you know there it is and um you know maybe maybe not it's been said before let's put it that way uh but uh we will we'll see you know like like many other things um Talk is cheap, but let's see what happens. And, you know, I, I don't know enough about the specific people who are spearheading this particular initiative to comment on it one way or another. Perhaps somebody more familiar with PCUSA uh, can talk about that. You know, the good news is if the majority of PCUSA is still there and people like what they're doing, well, then the majority of the party is still there. So, you know, it is what it is. My understanding was like there was already a splinter group, uh, People's Revolutionary Party or something like that. This was like a year ago when Danky Kang left the party and had a lot to say about it. But anyway. Um, all right, catching up with the chat. Um, somebody needs to be kicked out of the chat because... Um, You really have nothing better to do but to uh, just come in here and, like, lob abuse. I'm sure, I'm sure there's a better use of you. Uh, okay, I think Bad Empanada calling Cedar a neocon is a joke, but he was indeed a hawkish Democrat. Maybe, again, I'm not, not real, uh, you know, whatever. Who the fuck cares? <laughs> Sam Cedar. I mean, I yeah, I know there on some level it should be contended with, but who who deeply cares? I'm sure no one. Uh, sorry, I'm I'm dodging some uh, from Seabeg. There's some there's some of the usual like thoughts on questions, and I just don't really do those. I've never read any Grover Fur. So I don't know that I have said anything about Grover Fur. It's maybe the first thing I'm saying. I've not read any. Um, you know, he comes up, I mean, I, I saw part of a presentation by him. Um, I think that you can make a case for like, you know, even the Stalin years of the USSR while 
not always the best things happened are defensible. I think you can make a case for that without without Grover Fur. So I have not felt like a particular calling to go read that. That's just not like really my I, I feel like we have problems in front of us that need to be solved that really don't involve like debating, you know, like the twenties to the like through the forties of the USSR roughly. Like there's just a lot of other stuff that can or particularly like the thirties up to like maybe the early fifties. There's just a lot of other things that we can do that don't necessarily involve debating the ins and outs of that time period. And um, I would like to try to solve some of those questions. Like, like I said, I think you can make a case that like Stalin was not as bad as he usually gets made out to be without, without the Grover fur. And I just, I just haven't picked it up. I am aware that, you know, the presentation I saw, it seemed like a little, a little kooky. Um, I didn't really hear much content, but, uh, you know, again, this, these are passing impressions. I'm not trying to say one thing or another about Grover fur. It, it's not like a big priority. I, as you know, I tend to, um, read more, um, of the theory and the sources and we'll be doing a big pass of that before I get around to books that are more about, you know, historians takes rather than the sources so much, but, um, Yeah it's 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 not really here or there for me he did a collab with infracell so yeah okay i no, i did not know that <laughs> like i said um that's crazy oh boy yeah well let's just say that um Let's just say that if he's doing collabs with Infracell, that doesn't really hurt his or doesn't really help his reputation in my book. All right. Yes, I am reading it, Fred underscore Engels. <laughs> Grover Fur is like the black book of communism, but for communists. So yeah. Well, we're caught up with the end of the chat, and to be honest, uh, you know, for a sort of unprepared stream that I sort of only recorded half of, uh, this ended at exactly the right time. We do about uh, two hours here, and we started about quarter after, so that's exactly where we're at. If anybody has any um, closing questions or comments you'd like to get out there, I'll give you a minute to do that. Otherwise, um, thanks to the current patrons, and, you know, thinking that I wasn't, well, that wasn't entirely the reason why. Uh, but this, um, the patron screen I'm about to put up is, uh, not, a hundred percent up to date. And the search engine doesn't give you the search thingy that you're looking for. How does it do? Okay, there we go. Okay. A uh, couple people have signed up since I made this, so my apologies. You'll be featured in the next video. But thanks to the current patrons whose names are on the screen. Uh, patreon.com slash socialism for all if you'd like to get your name on the screen every donation is helpful it's allowed me to spend a lot more time on this channel than i would have been able to do otherwise so it is much appreciated and uh, it's great to see so many people turning out we're actually having a record month for people signing up as subscribers we're currently at plus 721 for the last 28 days never even really been close to that before so um, that's great. It's good to see more and more people, um, you know, taking the time to learn about socialism and to interact with the chat and interact with the comments. All of that is helping to build this, uh, outlet as a resource and a hub and, you know, a place where people can go to find people who are actually somewhat knowledgeable about this stuff and learn something, ask questions, whatever. I want to remind people also that, um, you know, it, it is up on the uh, the basic screen that um, that we use, which is this one. Uh, you know, the Patreon's there, but there's a SoundCloud, soundcloud.com slash socialism for all. Basically, I think I have to catch up on uploading some stuff over there, but there are, I think, over 300 files up there now. And um, all of the audiobooks are downloadable as an MP3. You just click a button. So if you do have a SoundCloud account, go over, follow you know, like, share, subscribe, all that kind of stuff, uh, repost the stuff. But yeah, the SoundCloud, I've probably done the least amount of plugging of that. But uh, yeah, there's an audio only backup of uh, 
most of the stuff over on the main channel. I've prioritized moving over the audiobooks. Like I said, I think the stuff from the last two weeks is not over there. Um, just been kind of busy, but um, yeah, or it may be. I, I might be forgetting. I don't know. Anyway, let's check in with the chat and see if anybody else had anything else to add. And not really. So we're going to wrap it up here. Thanks again to everybody for showing up in the chat and for listening to this on YouTube afterwards. And we will catch you in the next video.